Jan, how are you? Sandra, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Good, good. good. Hey there. What's up, Baron? I'm good. You were here last time. Just go into room one. Okay. And grab blankets and bolsters and make a throne. Make it, make yourself comfortable wherever wherever you want. Seminar. Reverse for the paradise today. You did that? We did that. It's a huge part of the club. I'm glad you're here for that. Who are y'all? I have a question for okay. you. Okay. I got approved to finally do a story at work about yoga. Awesome. So I was wondering if I could work with you guys. Work with him. him? Work with Jim. Jim? She just, she just got approved to do a, a feature about yoga. So, for, for chaos? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what you gonna do about it? What are you gonna? I want to do. I want to do like a two-parter. One part just about the yoga community and college station. How are you? How are you? Good, Cliff. Yeah. Good to meet you. Yeah, you too. Yeah. All right, most of them. You're welcome. You're good. Well, I was, you know, I was talking about grass-fed beef and. And I put up there, I said, you know, I, I, I said, you can get it from H-E-B. And I said, I just, I like to order from Slanker Meats. Nice. And then the next day, I see Chris Field <laughs> mention yeah, your nice. name in a post. And I'm like, well, I mean, I'd much rather do it local. Yep. So, I appreciate that. So at least have you come in and talk about it and then, um, you know, tell them how to get a hold of you and all that stuff, whatever you want. So there's probably about 20, 25, 30 people in there, depending, probably a few more rolling, rolling in in a minute. So. You can bring your family? No, my no. kids were kind of at the yeah. end of the weekend. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> I get it. And where do you, where do you live? Where is, your, where is your farm? Well, I actually live in town right now. My grandparents' house is out at, at our place. Okay. And we're, we're hoping to build out there this year. But it's in Curtin. So okay. It's about 12 miles outside town. And do you work out there full time? No. Or do you have no, another I job? I work at the university. Okay. I'm trying so you, to eventually move to out there. Because that's what you want to do. Yeah. yeah, I get that. So, Absolutely. I like what I do for the university. But I Hello, how are you? <laughs> yeah, what do you wear at the university? Uh, I'm a professor in the ag engineering department. Okay. So. Yep. But, uh, did, you, did you go to school here? I did. And yeah, have yeah, a, I'm actually from Bryan. We're, we're okay. You have a fifth fifth generation PhD yeah. to teach, yeah? Yep. yep. Very good. Yeah, I took over the place, trying to get it to a place where we could actually make a living at it. Good, just you're good. And I had an interview that I had posted up. Um, Jim Wood from, hi there, hi what's up? Jim Wood from uh, uh, U.S. Wellness Meets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good guy. And yeah. a, a really a guy who really understands, and I'm sure you too, but I mean, just a wealth of information. He's like a fourth generation farmer on yeah. that land. Yeah. And he does that full time. And uh, so it was interesting interviewing him. Yeah. 
talking to him about about that stuff. So anyway, you can talk as long as you want. I mean, I, that means I can cut my stuff shorter. So, <laughs> well, so if you just go, that's I'll fine. Do whatever you want to do. So, I love I love talking about it. They think you know I'm, I really enjoy answering people's questions. People know where their food comes from. We'd have kindergarten classes because we we milk our own cows too. We'd have kindergarten classes. Do you, do you sell raw milk? No, no. no. I've, I've got a guy neighbor that does. Really? You can get it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is that legal in Texas? No. So what you have to do is you, you it's a co-op and you buy a 30 second of a cow and then until you get a 30 second of a milk. Okay. So there's like ways around it. Sure. <laughs> so sure. It's just, it's weird that it's yeah. not legal. It's yeah. just. It's very weird. But so. the kids would come out and say, where's your milk come from? It comes from Kroger. Or, yeah. Where do you think it comes from before that? No idea. Really? No idea. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. You know, for some reason, when I was an undergrad, I was in hotel and rest restaurant management, okay, yeah. and I wanted to be open a restaurant, huh? and then when I realized it was weekends, evenings, holidays, yeah. I was kind of like, yeah. All right, maybe this isn't what I want to do. But my whole life, I've had a strong interest in nutrition, and then yeah. going into coaching and, huh? and exercise physiology, huh? and then I got a master's degree in sports nutrition. Okay. So nutrition is always just, I mean, I read like nutrition books just for fun. Yeah, yeah. It's just, just fascinating huh? stuff, for whatever reason, cultural history of food. and yeah. So all right, we can go in there, head in there. Um, yeah, might as well. Might as well be like, be like all the rest. All right, we're going to get rolling. And this is our studio. We opened it just last May. And we got about 400 members here. So it's... Has she? Yeah. yeah. All right. All right, we'll get started. I'm sure a few more people will join us in just, just a little bit. Um, we're going to start with, I, I brought in a special guest after last week talking about grass-fed meat and then, and then giving you guys that audio. And then the next day on Monday, I saw a post on Chris Field, who runs the BCS Marathon, on his page talking about this guy, Brock Faulkner, who has a farm and sells grass-fed beef. And so I, I asked him if he would come in and just talk about for a little bit about why it is so healthy. So I, I told him the top five reasons why grass-fed beef is, is better for you and why it's worth the money that it is. But he can talk about whatever he wants to and I don't care. So he has the floor. This is Brock Faulkner. Hey, appreciate it. <laughs> All right, well, I've got the notes here to keep me on point. But I, I think the best thing to do is, is I'll just tell you a little bit about grass-fed beef and, and when you're looking at it, what some of the terms mean and whatnot. And if you have questions, I'll be glad to answer those. Does that sound good? Okay, so I have to talk about kind of five reasons it's worth worth it to pay more for grass-fed beef. So I'll just kind of go through those and then, and, and, you know, I got questions if we're doing it, great. But kind of the first one, and, and probably the most obvious is, everybody talks about the benefit when you're eating protein, you want to eat lean meat, right? Well, grass-fed beef is going to be a lot more lean than other meat. But fat is not bad, okay? Fat-free is not all it's cracked up to be, as we found out in recent years. Good fats are really good for you. And so you really, you want lean meat, you want lean proteins, but you don't want fat free. And grass fed beef does have some fat, okay? Now there's a couple ways that you can get even more I don't know if there's a name of the farm. Beef out of grass fed beef. And there's he's two, a, he's two a good a ways, well there's two ways to do it, one's egg, good, egg. And one of them you kind of want to So he's a PhD First in this. Is you, you bright, bright guy. cattle that are genetically going to be more lean. And so we raise limousine cross cattle, and limousine cattle tend to be genetically more lean. But what you get with that is you still get marble. Okay, the other way you can get super lean meat is that you just harvest your calves or butcher your calves younger. All right. Well, that's going to give you a leaner piece of meat, but it's going to taste like leather, and you will have the most well-developed jawbone that you've ever seen. Because what gives beef its flavor and what gets, makes beef tender is marble. Okay, anybody know what marbling is? It's fat, but it's not fat around the outside of the meat. It's fat that's deposited inside the meat. Okay, so you don't actually physiology. You don't have the physiology of the cow. It's you're not going to start. With one hey, point. how are you? Basically, you the It's still much cleaner than something that you would get. And so how then 
if it's really good beef, the industry and the taste test has said that really good beef is highly marbled beef, and now we want beef that's more lean and doesn't have as much marbling, how then do you get a piece of beef that you actually enjoy eating? Well, the best way to do that is to buy aged beef. So what you do is you, you want to buy beef. If you're looking for really tasty grass fed beef, you want to buy natural aged grass fed beef. Okay, so what do all those things mean? The natural, which I'll talk about here in a second, is how you know that it doesn't have an antibiotics and hormones in it. Okay? Grass-fed beef can still have antibiotics. It could still have been administered any antibiotic, and it could still have artificial hormones in it. Okay? Natural grass-fed beef does not have those things. And they usually go hand in hand, but not always. So if you're interested in having hormone-free, antibiotic-free beef, you need to make sure that that label says natural. Well, okay, and then if you want really tender, really tasty stuff, you want it, you want it to be aged as well. So what that does is, after we butcher the cat, we let that carcass hang. And I'm gonna use all those words that are gonna make you real excited, right? We let it hang for 28 days, and that weight just pulls that beef longer and longer. It's just a muscle, okay? And the longer it stays there, the more tender it's gonna get. And those microbes that naturally break that meat down are actually gonna make it much more flavorful. So the best tasting healthiest beef you can get is going to be natural aged grass fed okay so any questions about that where where you buy from me <laughs> um, there's a couple of there's a couple of us that i know of that within kind of the five county area that provide that, that kind of beef uh, uh, there's two of us that i know of that, that actually wait to put through the calves until there's actually the good marbling and uh, and so I'd be glad to leave some business cards and magnets, and then, and then the other place that does it is Wild Pipe, which is out in Milo County, uh, and they they will deliver here as well. But uh, I don't I don't really know where you can find in the grocery store where it, you have natural, aged, and grass fed. You can usually get two of the three, but I don't know in the grocery store where you can get all three. I'm not saying it's not there. It's not where you can get okay. Um, like I said, we like to, we, we believe that, that our product is, is really good and, and it's kind of funny, Cliff asked me why it was worth paying more. If, with the way these prices are in the, in the grocery store right now, um, we're actually less expensive than what you would buy at the grocery store for, for natural aged grass fed beef if you buy it by the bulk. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But the other thing that we're thinking about fats is we want to make sure we're getting the right type of fat. Okay, so the two major types of fat that you're going to be uh, seeing in beef is going to be omega-6s and omega-3s. Okay, so omega-6s are going to be inflammatory. They're going to cause a pro-inflammatory response in your body. Okay, they're going to be linked with more heart disease. Okay? Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory, and they're linked with good health. So we want to pay attention to that ratio of omega-3s to omega-6 fatty acids in Beef, okay, when you look at grass fed beef, that ratio is about three to one. Okay, when you look at grain fed beef coming out of the feed yard, it's 21 to one. All right, so we're looking at a significant difference in the ratio of omega 3 and omega 6 fatty acids between grass fed beef and grain fed beef. It all has to do, we can tell you all the reasons why, but basically, when a, when a uh, when cattle are taken off of green grass and they're put where they're given uh, grains, it changes the chemistry in their gut, it's more acidic. You don't get omega, they're not getting omega-3s in their diet and so they're not passing it on and depositing it in their meat. And so I'm not gonna bore you with all the physiology, but there's a huge difference in the composition of fat in grass-fed beef and grain-fed beef as well, okay? Um, kind of the when you also look at what that animal is able to transfer from their food source into your food source, uh, grass-fed beef is going to have more antioxidant vitamins like E, C, beta carotene, those kinds of things that are naturally occurring in chlorophyll. So we want those animals to consume as much chlorophyll as possible. Um, again, grass-fed beef is usually correlated with, uh, with not having hormones, not having beta agonists, and not having antibiotics, but not always. So you want to make sure that it has that natural label as well. Uh, I work a good bit with the conventional food production industry. I'm an agricultural engineer by training. Uh, I, do, I, I work with these folks a lot. And so I can tell you, you know, just from personal experience, kind of what the normal regime is at a feed yard. Uh, I've done a good bit of, of research 
personally. Uh, I've, I've gone through cancer diagnosis in the last year, just on kind of what what it is that we want to prioritize. And I'll tell you this, uh, if I were prioritizing, if, if I had, well, like I do, we have a given budget for our groceries, right? And if I was going to prioritize paying more for certain things, probably the first thing I would say is make sure that the dairy products you're buying don't have RBSC in them, which most of them don't, like your Hill Country Fair brand doesn't have it anymore. You can look on the label, it says no RBSC, that kind of thing. The second thing I would prioritize is making sure that getting a meat source that doesn't have the extra hormones and extra antibiotics that, that you're going to get in conventional production. And then you kind of kind of go from there. But I think that, that would be my second highest priority from a, from a health perspective. We just don't know enough about what they do in our bodies when we consume those products and have those things. Done. Okay, and then the third, or the fifth thing is, is uh, grass-fed beef is just going to be higher in a lot of the minerals, trace minerals that we need. It's higher in calcium, it's higher in magnesium, and it's higher in potassium in particular. And, uh, and so for all those reasons, I think it's, it's worth paying that extra, extra little bit. Okay, now. Where can you get it from? There's a number of places that you can. Wild type sales at Village Foods. I know, I know that Brazos Natural Foods has uh, grass-fed beef that's, that's natural, but I know they've had. I know historically they've had some issues keeping a consistent supply. I don't know if they resolved that or not. Uh, we we sell directly to consumers at our ranch. Um, can you remind me? Yes, Faulkner Farms. I'll, I'll tag everybody in a Facebook post yeah. <clears throat> to his Facebook page. And I'll leave All information, please. Yeah. Uh, I'll leave some business cards and some refrigerator magnets for you to pick up if you like to do it. I love answering questions about where your food comes from. So please feel free to email me, post a question on Facebook, whatever. I'll be glad to respond to those because I really enjoy, enjoy this, this kind of interaction. Uh, we do sell individual cuts as they're available. So if you just say, well, I want six ribeyes to feed to my friends that are coming over, we can do that. But by far the best deal, uh, we want we want to use the entire animal. And we believe that the whole thing is good, even if it's a part of a cut of beef that you're not accustomed to, to cooking. And so uh, the way we really like to sell uh, beef, and when I say we, it's my wife and myself and our three kids that they run the ranches. We like to sell in quarters or eighths, and uh, when we do that, we get it cut exactly like you want it. So if it's if you've got a huge family and you want six pound roasts, then we want to give you six pound roasts. If you want, if it's just a couple of you and you want two to three pound roasts, then we want to give you two to two to three pound roasts. I like my steaks real thick, so I get them cut inch and a half thick. Some people don't; they want them thinner. And so what we like to do is work with our customers to figure out how are you going to enjoy this the most. How is it going to not go to waste? Because we don't want you throwing away a bunch of it. We get it cut exactly like you want it. We don't we don't butcher our steers until somebody's ready to, to to buy. And then we take it down to Nevada Soda. It's USDA inspected. Hangs for 28 days. And you have to get that aged product, and that'll deliver it straight to your house uh, at a time that's convenient for you. And so we can then if you get 75 pounds of beef, which is about what an eighth is takes up a, a box, about two cubic feet of beef, put it in your freezer, and you start going through, and you say, I have never cooked a chuck roast in my life. I have no idea what I'm doing. And you look on our website. My sister-in-law, who is the best cook that I've ever met in my life, has helped us out by developing a whole bunch of recipes to help folks figure out how to utilize that meat in different ways. And so, you know, my wife had never cooked a roast without using a can of like cream of mushroom soup. What we were trying to come down on our fats. And so there's several recipes now on there that show you, you know, there's some of those good southern recipes, right? We got I got a recipe for chicken fried steak on there as well, in case you don't know how to use a round steak. But we got some tips on how to use how to use cook cook uh, different cuts of meat in ways that maybe you haven't uh, had before. Uh, how to use roasts in some way that you're family doesn't just get absolutely sick of having the same meal every time and, and we really want to help help folks enjoy good healthy beef uh, in, in a ton of different ways so it's kind of what we what we do and, and what we're about and i'd be glad to answer any questions that you have yes do you raise anything besides the beef do you do chicken we don't right now this beef is what i no, and so that's what we do with. And uh, we're we're getting into we're <clears throat> in order to take care of. If you're going to raise good grass fed beef, you have to have good grass, right? And if you're going to have good grass, you got to have healthy soils. And so one of the things that we're really working towards 
is uh, some innovative ways of weed control, which one of the ways to do that is you get sheep or goats to come in behind your cattle and they eat things that the cattle don't like. So we're really working at getting some lamb, but I don't produce a consistently good product yet, so I'm not willing to sell it to anybody else with my name on it. <laughs> but hopefully in the near future, that's, that's kind of the goal. Do you recommend anyone that sells chicken? Uh, Yonder Way Farms, I know does it, and they have, have eggs as well. Uh, Yonder Way Farms? Yonder Way. Yeah, they're, they're down in Fayette County now, but I think they still deliver up here. They do, yeah. Okay, so they still deliver up here. Uh, eggs and chickens? They do eggs, they do chickens, they do beef, but their beef is, is, is only about 12 months old, and so it's, okay. it's not a product that I would want to consume, but their eggs and their chicken is really, is really good. You know, so. Do you have any prices? I, I do on the website. Basically, though, if you buy an eighth or a quarter or half, it's eight dollars a pound delivered. So it's just a flat price of eight dollars a pound. So it's a little expensive for ground beef. It's super cheap. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so on the grass, do you use any kind of pesticides or anything like that? Uh, okay. So let me explain what we do, and then if you have really healthy soils, then you're not going to have Problems, but we still do have kind of ball yes. So I haven't used yes. I chemical herbicides or pesticides. I've taken the place over from my grandfather, who was yeah. kind of a different generation of used to grow up. Maybe call it looking at my I have that tool in my toolbox, but I haven't used it in so long that I can't yeah, really that's tell you the last time that's, that's happened. We were live with poultry litter. There's two times in a cow's life when they're going to be really stressed. And if you allow them to go through that stress without supplementing their feet, then that their meat is going to be, one, it's, their meat is going to be tougher, and two, I think that I have a responsibility for that animal's well-being. Right. And so if I know I'm intentionally stressing it, and I take it off its mother, or when the grass is not good and it gets cold, then we'll give up the 25% of their dry matter, we'll give them some feet, okay? Now, they don't get anything in the last 210 days of their life, which makes all of the meat chemistry exactly like they only got the grass their entire life. But there are two periods that we give, that we do supplement to try to keep that animal from getting stressed. The feed that we give them is not organic. And so it, what we produce is not organic beef, but it is grass-fed, and there is a difference. Now, there's, there's no difference health-wise, chemistry-wise, any of that stuff, but it's going to be a less expensive product than having to go and source organic feed stuff during those two periods of their life when that animal is really stressed. But when, the, when my cattle were hitting 20 degree temperatures this week, I couldn't in good conscience let them do that without a full belly, basically. So we went and we, you know, we supped with them this week. So you can order online. Yep, there you go. Yeah. Right. Very cool. Did that cover everything you I think you did. Any other questions? Good. All right. There you go. Testimonial. There you go. <laughs> All right. Brock, thank you so much. And, and I, <clears throat> thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Okay. And, and like I said, I'll tag him, his, his website and all that stuff in, in a Facebook post. So, very cool. All right. Let's see. All right. Let's talk about adrenal fatigue just a little bit. We do have a workshop um, coming up soon. I don't have the date set yet. Uh, dealing with adrenal fatigue because this is a full workshop of information. So I'm going to go through this quickly because there's a lot of parallels to what we're talking about with mindful eating and adrenal fatigue. So I want to touch on this because like I had said that it's a thought that up to 80% of Americans have a certain level or a certain amount of adrenal fatigue which means that your adrenals are not producing the right level, the right amount or they're stressed and your, your hormone, hormones become imbalanced. Thanks Brock, I appreciate it. Um, become, so the, you have a, a hormonal imbalance. The, one of the top ways is because your adrenal glands, which produce cortisol, and you've all heard of cortisol, which in the last four, five, six 
eight years maybe is kind of a buzzword. Before that, we didn't know what cortisol was. I mean, scientists did, but really it's a newer found hormone. So only in the last few years, we've found in just kind of the literature that we read or, or, or talk about cortisol. And so we know that that an increase in cortisol over a period of time, consistent increase in cortisol is not a good thing. Okay, so your adrenal glands are in charge of either burning the fat and feeling energized or storing fat and being tired, one of the two. So when you go into, when we thrive, so when we're feeling good, everything's going well, we're eating well, exercising well, we are in full health, we call that thriving. <clears throat> means that when we are thriving, our adrenal glands are burning all the fat, we can eat up to 3,000 calories. I mean, look, I, I've trained plenty of men, but women too, who will come in and say, and it isn't very often, but women that'll come in that'll say, I want to add some muscle and I want to look really good, they'll be eating 3,000 calories a day. So when we say the calories don't really matter, they don't really matter if you're eating the right foods at the right time, which the, these women are, and eating really quality foods, the adrenal glands are going full blast and they're eating that food and the body turns it into muscle. And these aren't bodybuilding women. These are just women who, well, just look really fit. But they just want more strength and they want a little bit more size and so those are people that are thriving. And anybody can thrive if your adrenal glands are going well. And then surviving is when your adrenal glands are storing fat and burning muscle and this is what we believe that 80% of Americans are in some level of this. Some people who are really in a deep level are the people that probably go to the doctor and say, I think I have, have um, well, there's, I mean, there's a ton of different things that people will go in, but they'll go in and say, I'm tired, I don't feel good, I can't get out of it, I'll sleep three times a day, I'm sleeping nine to ten hours a night, I don't understand it, I'm putting on fat, I can't take it off. And that's so common for doctors to hear that these days. And, and a lot of their appointments every single day are women more so saying that, but men also too. And this is where I was. I was in that place where I was just tired, I couldn't, couldn't get out of it. So that is when our body goes into survival, and it's good over the short term, just because of Back a long time ago when your body needed to survive, it stored fat and it made you more tired just to start building those reserves. So it's a good thing over the short term, but over the long term, here's what happens. When you were 18 years old, your adrenal glands had plenty of reserve in it. So when you got stressed or you were in survival mode because your boyfriend broke up with you in high school, right? And so for that next two weeks, you were really stressed and upset, but that was okay because you had a lot of reserve in your body to draw from. So you didn't feel negative effects after that. You bounced out after that and you all of a sudden had another boyfriend the next week. So, <clears throat> but here's what happens as we start aging, even getting to the age 30 and beyond, and it gets, get, just gets worse and worse, is our reserves start dissipating. Just like anything else in life, we just start not having what we had before. So you don't have that reserve, so now you are utilizing that reserve and then we have nothing left. And then we go to sleep and wake up and then we use it again and we have nothing left. And all of a sudden now we're digging ourselves into a grave and we don't realize that all we're doing is just doing life. We're going to work, we got our families, we have our exercise we're trying to get done. We're trying to eat healthy, but like he talked about, some surprise things in there, some information that we didn't know. So all of those things start happening and now we dig ourselves into a deep grave that cortisol doesn't just go up for a little bit and then come back down and then go up for a little bit. It goes up and it stays up consistently, constantly, all the time and it is absolutely impossible to burn fat no matter how few calories you eat. And I can't count how many times people would come to me, more so women, and I think I say that only because in, in my industry I, I was, always had more women that I work with, that would come in and say that I'm only eating 700 calories a day, I track everything I eat, and I can't lose fat. Or I'm eating, even if someone says I'm only eating 1,300 calories, which is a norm, more normal amount, and I can't lose weight. In fact, I'm gaining fat. And it's, we absolutely know why, and this is why it is. <clears throat> then we gotta talk about stress in their life. So, here are the things that cause stress in our body is processed foods creates inflammation, just like he talks about with the omega-3s and omega-6s. Really fascinating. We're talking about grass-fed beef and is it worth the money? You look at a 1 to 3 ratio as compared to, a, what do you say, 1 to 21 or 1 to 25 ratio, whatever it was, seven times the amount, omega-6s are inflammatory and omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. So if we have those balanced because your body needs omega-6s, if we have that balanced, we don't have a problem. When they're not balanced, we have a problem. The, here's the interesting thing, is that then that person that goes to the doctor and says, I'm tired, I don't, blah, 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 most doctors, and I'm speaking for all doctors because there are plenty of them that know the difference and won't say this, but it's very common for them to say, we need to just eat less, eat less red meat, is what they'll say, start, eat less meat and start exercising, and exercise more, and exercise harder. So, God bless you guys, what do we do? We go out and we try to eat less and exercise more, which puts us deeper into survival mode and puts us and digs us deeper into the adrenal fatigue. So someone who's in adrenal fatigue needs to start eating 
a lot more or us more of the right foods and exercising less. And interestingly, one of the things that is recommended when you exercise less, which is really hard for a lot of people to do, because we're so in our mind going, no, I want to exercise, I need to exercise. One of the things that you should go do is yoga. Not just because we're in a yoga studio, but that's one thing that's always recommended, is meditation and yoga. Taking a walk is fine to do. And if you're eating the right foods, you'll start losing weight. Um, Exact, exact, exact thing that I just said. So understand that food is the cure and not the enemy. We always, I think a lot of times we think that I gotta stop eating, I gotta cut out this, I gotta cut that out, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. That really eating a balanced diet of grass-fed beef being in there or the organic chickens or whatever is a positive good thing that, that can very, very quickly put you back in a balance. Okay. I don't know if that arrow, there it is. Okay, the arrow was in the right place. Physical, environmental, dietary, <coughs> Uh, em emotional stress increases cortisol puts us into survival mode all right I have examples of each one of those all right so those are the things so your physical stress your exercise and or your mental stress when you go to work that mental stress is the exact same as physical stress your body cannot differentiate between the two so you have a stressful moment at work or at home mental stress where you're just exhausted tired it's just you've had enough and you're done with whatever it is or physical stress, you go out and do a hard workout and your body needs to recover from it. Those two things, your body doesn't know the difference between those two types of stress. So your adrenals don't, don't do it any different. Dietary, and then the emotional stress is part of, part of the, well, we talked about with the emotional and environmental stress too. We'll talk about toxins in our everyday life a little bit today. All right, I think I already mentioned that. If we are in survival mode, we easily get fatter. And your body is supposed to do that. It's the way that God created it over the short term or over the winter time. If we're in thriving mode, which you can be in thriving mode year round. If we're in thriving mode, cortisol causes us to eat more, but the body can handle it. So when you are in the right mode, you're hungry. And then what happens is a lot of people get afraid of that and they start lowering their calories or being careful or pushing their weight going, I am starving all the time. I mean, how many people have said that to me or say that to yourself like, why am I hungry all the time? That is the best thing that can happen to you. I say that there is a little thing that can happen, and, and I was going to mention this last week. Here's something, a way I want you to start thinking about food, is don't think about calories, which we talked about. Think about the nutrients in your cells. So when your cell is hungry, have you ever eaten a big meal um, and it's not very healthy, and an hour later you're hungry again, you're like, I'm not hungry, but I'm starving, like I'm craving something. The reason is, is because you, all, some cells in your body or all the cells in your body didn't get what it needed and so it is telling your stomach or it's telling your brain, I need this so go eat. It doesn't care how full you are, so you are full but you're craving food. And that's what happens. So exercise for a long period of time, go run a marathon, go do an hour or two long workout. You're going to be full, you'll eat, have eaten, but you're like, I'm still, I still want something. It's because your body's deprived of certain vitamins and nutrients and minerals because you just exercised and lost all those. So in thinking of that, when you feel that, that's when a green smoothie or a million other things you could have to get those nutrients in there. Your body is, is craving certain nutrients, vitamins and minerals being really what it more, more, than, more than likely is. All right. <clears throat> Here are the stressful things that cause you to get, go into survival mode. Sugar is the number one food product that causes you to go into that survival mode, creates a hormonal imbalance, and increases inflammation in your body. We'll talk about inflammation in a little bit. The second one that's so important is highly processed carbs. So I looked at my bag of Cheetos, and yes, I always have Cheetos in my house, but I looked at the bag of Cheetos. I tr really try not to eat too many of those, but they're so good. Um, and on there, the first three ingredients is what you always see in highly processed food. And it was the fat that was in there was not a good fat. The sugar that was in there was high fructose corn syrup. And uh, the, um, what was I going to say, the, the other fat, fat and sugar, really those two things. And the fat was from a vegetable oil. And, and so those two things in your highly processed foods, the high fat and high sugar and almost everything that we eat is the big culprit. Now, <clears throat> we in America didn't, you know, I, I think a lot of researchers try to pretend like we ate before the 1960s, we America ate really healthy, and it didn't. It was the advent in the late 70s of high fructose corn syrup, and it was developed, it was found by some researchers, and then Kraft Foods was one of the first companies that took high, high fructose corn syrup and used it in all their products. In an interesting interview with the former CEO of Kraft Foods, he was talking, he said, I had no idea back then that this would cause the problems in America that we see. 
All I was trying to do was save our shareholders money because we could put high fructose corn syrup in there, which was a lot cheaper than sugar, and it was sweeter, and they could use less of it. So they put that on all their products, and Kraft Foods was one of the first ones to really go widespread with that. And so we know the high fructose corn syrup, it is sugar, but it does more things than what sugar does. It causes more inflammation than what sugar does. So be very careful of the high fructose corn syrup in there. And then vegetable oil, high omega-6s, very high inflammatory oil. And that's what they use because it's a lot cheaper than other oils. So olive oil and some of the other better whole food oils are a lot better. Watch the vegetable oils in the food. Environmental pollutants and light. You're probably looking at that light going, what, what are you talking about? I'll get to that in the next slide. Pollutants make sense, being pesticides. And I think when we do the adrenal fatigue workshop, we'll spend a whole ta time talking about the toxic house meaning your hair products and shampoos and soaps and cleaners that you use and detergents and all those things. And then I haven't gone quite 100% with that, but I'm getting closer to it and looking at all those things that are in there. So the toxins in our life and then light, which we'll get to, which is kind of interesting. And then life, work, finances, your relationships, your own personal security, and then over-exercising. We see significant problems in athletes that over-exercise. You know, there's a very big thing in triathletes that there have been a lot of triathletes. And then Jim Fix, if you remember that name, he was a runner, a marathoner, wrote a lot of books. He dropped over dead of a heart attack running out on the roads. Well, he had done so much that he had damaged his body. He, he had, they, when they did the autopsy, they found that his heart was damaged from all the work that he did. And it was just too much. And uh, in an interesting podcast, I, I listened to talking about those athletes that had died and people, there are a lot of top level triathletes that in, back in my day I had heard of that have disappeared and they're not that old, but they got into adrenal fatigue so badly that it took them well over a year to come out of it and they weren't willing to go back into training again. So over-exercising can be too much. And how much is enough? Really, the research shows we don't need to do that much. When I, t I, when I talk to my running club and I tell you guys, guys, don't do this for health and don't do this for weight loss because what we're doing is trying to compete in a marathon and finish a marathon comfortably because really training as much as we do is not healthy. Wow, kind of surprising. People are like, what? I signed up to lose weight and get healthy. But training for a marathon is more than you should really do for optimal health and for weight loss. Because really, we'll see a lot of times people training for a marathon will put on more weight. And a lot of times, a lot of times it's just because their diet is, is poor and, and certainly a lot of that. But a lot of times they're training so hard so much, they're pushing themselves into so much stress and their adrenals are really out of whack and their, hom their hormones are very much imbalanced. So, okay. So those arrows, aren't, the arrows are supposed to pop up automatically. All right, adrenal balance and due, to, due to foods. Processed foods, when you eat those, and those are those foods that have sugar in it, high fructose corn syrup, the processed carbohydrates that are so refined that your body takes that and it, it digests it immediately. This is not new news. This is really from back in the Atkins diet days. We know this. So those processed foods that are, that are digested very quickly go down in your body, and then we have inflammation all throughout. You probably have felt, we all have felt this, that when you eat poorly, your joints hurt a lot more. And I would say, and I don't know that I've never heard a number of this, but so many people that have arthritis and have bad joints and their joints are hurting all the time, it's not because they've worn away their cartilage, certainly there is some of that, but more, than, more often than not, it's because of inflammation in the diet. And you start eating more of an anti-inflammatory diet, cutting down the sugar, cutting down on <coughs> some proteins we'll talk about, and all of a sudden the joints just stop hurting. And one of the products that i uh, probably talk about in the next, next segment is um, called Capraflex from Mount Capra. And that is the best joint supplement. And all it is is a very strong anti-inflammatory. That's all it is. Because we know that joint pain is generally just due to inflammation because of our diet or over-exercising. Look, when you exercise, even if it's just a 30-minute shorter thing, you have inflammation in your body. You cut yourself, somewhat exercise, you do damage to your body, you, you get stressed, you get a cut on your body, you're gonna have inflammation. So inflammation is a good thing over the short term, long term, it can cause problems. Sugar, fructose being high fructose corn syrup. So we think of fructose, or I do, in fruit. That can also do that if someone was overeating a lot of fruit, but fructose, I'm talking more about high fructose corn syrup, dairy and wheat. I'll talk about dairy in a second. Symptoms are fatigue and flu-like symptoms. So a response to sugar, dairy, and wheat, a lot of times, and, and most people, can cause fatigue. We know that. And then flu-like symptoms, where you just don't feel good. Or inflammation is correlated to a histamine response in your body. So when you have allergens come in from the outside in the fall time, if you have ragweed, or in this time of year, the cedar, or whatever, and you have allergies, 
Some person, people might wonder, why am I getting allergies in the spring? I never have allergies in the spring. Well, look at your diet. Because of those foods are creating, because of the inflammation, a histamine response in your body, and therefore it's going to, it's going, the symptoms are going to be allergies. Or people that have allergies really badly, and there's so many more kids with allergies nowadays. It isn't because there's more cedar in the air. It is because of the food that is that is being eaten, because of that response. There's that. Inflammation due to those foods sends your body into that sur survival mode. So anytime you eat food that increases inflammation, how do you know? Puffy face, when you feel that feeling, your joints are starting to hurt more, an allergic feeling, flu-like symptoms where you just don't quite feel good. Now in the past, I had always felt those things were, hmm, I wonder what I'm allergic to in the outside. Or I wonder when my joints are hurting. I'm exercising a lot, that makes sense. Or I'm tired more. Well, I just didn't get enough sleep last night. Start looking at those things and say, what did I eat yesterday? Oh, that kind of makes sense. I ate this way yesterday and I'm, I'm feeling like this. So instead of looking at the environment, necessarily the allergens or not getting enough sleep, a lot of times it is, most more often than not, it is your food. Okay, adrenal imbalance due to environmental toxins. This is fascinating to me. Since 1900, over three million chemicals have been introduced into our world that have been made and created for certain reasons, whatever they are, three million different in the last, not even 100, well, 100 years, 100 years. Pesticides, <coughs> solvents, body products, soaps, and BPA. I'll tell you a story that I was like the king of chemicals in my yard. I mean, I'd see a weed and I'm out there and I'm spraying like three times a day. I'm, I'm broadleaf weed killer was like my thing. I'd buy like these big, huge things. And I, cause I wanted my yard to be perfect. So we had this beautiful golden retriever named Maggie and she died at seven years old and got bone cancer. So we put her to sleep. And then a week or two later, I was reading a magazine that broadleaf weed killer has an ingredient in there that causes bone cancer in dogs. Then all of a sudden I realized I probably killed my dog because I liked my yard better. And then I realized because she would go out there and just roll and roll and roll in the, in the yard. And the lady from the garden center who I really liked, the, who I was went and talked to, she said, you've got to start doing organic garden. You've got to start doing that. You've got kids now. And I'm like, holy cow, what have I done to my kids? So pesticides we know cause a lot of problems like that. Solvents, paints, all those kind of things in your garage. I know uh, a lady who there was, they have a, have a big warehouse and her office is in the warehouse and they decided to rent part of that warehouse off out to a chemical company and they put all these chemicals in there and then she got cancer and they li linked it to those chemicals that were just in there. They were in airtight barrels but they just were, were in the environment enough. Um, our soaps are loaded with that but we'll, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. And then BPA. BPA is in all your plastics. So your Tupperware is a really bad culprit and you can buy glass Tupperware, meaning you, if you agree with this and say I'm going to do this, that means all your Tupperware goes and you buy all the glass stuff and it's an expense. But there is a huge amount of BPA, unless you see it's BPA free, in all of our plastic products. So people who are really hardcore with this will only eat things that are in glass and store their things in glass. So at least take a look at this. What I would say to people when I talk about this, I'm not 100% all the way with all this stuff, but I, I try to go, I'm getting a little bit more and a little bit more all the time. You choose how much you want to go and how important it is to you in your life. Some people say, I don't, I'm not going to do any of that. Some people say, I'm really interested in this. I want to go all the way with it. If you go all the way with it, it can be difficult, a really difficult change. So you choose how much you want to do. I just want you to have the information. So BPA comes from the water, in our the city water and groundwater that we get, also in our air and then also in the packaging. Research in 2012 found that they, they took 50 different people and they looked at their fat cells and it was the, the BPA, the amount of BPA in their body, in their fat cells, was directly correlated with their obesity. So the people who had very low BPA, but they said that 100% of the people they tested had some BPA in there. But the more BPA, the more obese they were. There was a direct correlation between those two. So again, we're just talking about something that causes a hormonal imbalance in your life. So when we look at, I think, to me, when we look at these things, it isn't just about calories. A calorie is just one small thing and really isn't even that important. Or even just what we eat isn't, all, isn't everything. It's also the environment. And like I said, you choose how far you want to go, go with it. Another thing too, people who are in envi environmentally toxic things. So people that I've, I've taught this to throughout the years that I trained, when they would start making these changes, they, they would say that I can just handle stress so much better. Like things hit me in life and I just, just rolls right off my back. So the, the BPAs and the environmental toxins are a big culprit for us able to ha handle anxiety, stress, and then all the things that go along with that. Pretty interesting. All right, light pollution. This is interesting, and I actually do this to a degree. Um, this, well, let me tell you first. Artificial light 
and decreased sunlight intake increases stress and adrenal imbalance. So getting sunlight. And I did some research, remember who talked about the, the um, sun and the cancer. It's 10 to 15 minutes of up to 30% of your body once a day is enough to get the vitamin D that you need. Um, they say up to 30 minutes shouldn't be a problem, but then again, there are so many variables. What is your skin like and how much can you handle and everyone's body is different. So if you're fair, more fair, less, if you're darker, I can handle more, skin, more sun than other people, um, but if you're lighter or more fair, then a little bit less. But everybody needs some sunlight each day, if possible, is good. Um, but artificial light, the artificial light that we have isn't as good as the natural light, for sure. So. The artificial light disrupts your sleep balance. So all sleep research correlates to healthy hormone balance. So the most important thing, which is so hard to understand and because it's like, if we get less sleep, I can get more done and I'm more successful. And then if we work hard, if we're up and awake and up and around, we should be able to burn more calories and lose more weight. That just kind of makes common sense, but it's the complete opposite. That if you get good quality, deep sleep, that you will be able to burn more, more fat simply through proper hormonal balance. Meaning also that you feel better, you have less fatigue, you have less of all the stuff that goes along with this. So sleep is so incredibly important. Deep sleep, immediately that night, tonight, if you get enough sleep and go into a deep sleep, you have decreased cortisol, boom, right there, it fixes it, it gets you on track in one night or starts to in one night, and then decreased fat to be used for fuel. For fuel. So you, you will utilize, I don't know if I wrote that right, when you get deeper sleep and you get, get quality sleep, you will utilize more fat for fuel at night and throughout the next day when you get enough sleep. If you are in a very low amount of sleep, which it's become in our country, it's very cool and, and you, people think you're a hero if you're going on four hours of sleep at night because that means you're a hard worker. We're like one of the only countries that's like that. Most people, you know, they take siestas and they, they, get, they get sleep, but we don't. So we use more fat for fuel. Lack of sleep e equals muscle fatigue and weight gain no matter how few calories you eat just because of the hormonal imbalance because your cortisol needs to do its job at night, your liver needs to do a job at night. There's so many processes that happen in our body only at night and so many processes that happen only when we get into that REM sleep and get into that deep sleep. So when you get into that deep sleep and you stay in there for an enough amount of time, you will get that. Um, people that have sleep apnea, sleep apnea, 99% of the people that have sleep apnea, it is because of, not because of light, but it's not only lack of sleep, but it's what they're eating. And so instead, they'll go, to, you'll get a sleep test and they'll find this out, and then they get on a machine that does some of the work for them, but it's not solving the problem. It's like a Tylenol, right? You just mask the pain for a little bit and then it's back instead of solving the problem. But don't get me started on that, because so there's so many people that will get on those machines so that they can, because so, they have sleep apnea and they're not sleeping well, when in reality, it's as simple as changing your diet for the, for the most part. Low carb diets, interestingly, so when someone is all high protein and they're trying to eat as high protein as they can, which is really, we don't see that that much anymore. I mean, the Atkins diet was big with that. Um, decreases quality sleep. So don't think that just eating carb diet. And by the way, uh, we're eating a high protein diet. If someone says, would you advocate low carb or high carb or low fat? Or, here's the answer. Moderation across all three, protein, fat, and carbohydrate. Just moderation of all three. That's what it is. So we've gone through, everyone in this room has gone through the low fat trend. When I started college, that was what was beat into our brain in every class and every professor was low fat, like no fat. If you can get down to like 5% fat, and then we started realizing we need a little bit more fat than that. Then it all of a sudden went to, when we moved here in 99, that's when Atkins came back, because Dr. Atkins first came out with his program in the 1960s, and then it resurrected because an investor said, hey, let's bring this back because it's time. And the Dr. Atkins had a new revolution, so we saw high protein. So low fat, and then high fat with Dr. Atkins, high fat, high protein. So it went like, like that. But still, you see low fat everywhere. And then, of course, with the, Dr. Atkins, it was low carb. Just the other day, I was in the grocery store and there was a package of Twizzlers and it said low fat on it or no fat. I'm like, you're kidding me. I mean, that's still, that's still out there. It's like, so anyway, that was a 1980s thing. All right, let's, go to, let's get to mindful eating. Here was something that um, a mentor said to me about six months ago. We were talking and he was, we were going through business stuff and, and talking about life stuff and everything. And I was talking, I was going on and on. I was talking for about five or 10 minutes and he stopped me and he goes, Cliff, do you realize you're never, you're nowhere? When you're at work, you're at home. When you're at home, when you're at work. When you're exercising, you're not there. You're at work or home or wherever else. He realized you, you're nowhere. And that hit me for the first time. Like, holy cow, it's true. I'm really nowhere. I'm never there. I'm somewhere else. When I'm in yoga, 
I'm not there. I'm thinking about something at the front desk or I'm thinking about what I need to do as soon as I get out of here and I gotta be in a hurry when I'm exercising. So that was the moment that I realized I need to start becoming more present. And then I would get stressed about how do I get more present? I would be real stressed when I was thinking about that. How do I do this? So when, since, I will tell you, since I've done this, my workouts, be, because I'm present, are so good. Because it used to be that I would work out and 30 minutes into it, an hour into it, whatever the time was, I'd be like, I gotta get back home, I got stuff to do, that's more important, that's really my job, I can't be doing this all the time, I gotta, and I would be stressed, and I would, now it's, here's my workout and I'm gonna do this, and no matter what else gets in the way, this is what I'm gonna focus on. And then I'm gonna go do this and focus on it, and I'm able to get so much more done, quality of those things that I choose to do. When I'm with my kids, I'm with my kids. Now that isn't always easy to do, because that, it's so easy, because William will be on Minecraft, and Elizabeth's over there, you know, she loves to color and, and glue and scissors and tape and everything else in the arts and craft department she loves. And they're doing that, and I'm like, well, okay, I'll just do this. And I'll, then I look around, I'm like, all right, guys, come here, let's turn that off, let's, let's, do, let's be present, all right. Here's something else I learned, too, is that on the, on the other side of pain, whatever pain you have, and we all had some sort of pain today, whatever it was, and throughout our lives, I'm sure each of us has at least one or two or 10 or 20 different things of some really big pain that we've had in our lives. But every day that you have pain, learn to accept that pain because it is what it is. And I'll talk about this book in a, little, in a bit. But on the other side of every ounce of pain that is given to us, that is out of our control generally, is power for us to become more of what we want to become. And once I started embracing that, it's like, okay, this is painful. A workout, it's painful. But on the other side of that pain is power to go compete. So that's something that I want. Or on the other side of um, eating this, that it doesn't taste very good. There's power, because when I get done with this, it's good, it's fine, and I'm not gonna miss my Cheetos. Well, I would miss Cheetos, but um, is, on the other side of that is power that, gosh darn it, I did this. So I have several things that I do every single morning when I wake up, and it's kind of hard to do and stay on track with those. But when I get done, I feel power because I did those things. And there were, those are things that are my choice and not things that you would do, but they're things, and I feel power from that. So understand on the other side of, of pain is power. So two powerful things that have changed a lot of the way I think and do. Emotional eating is always about avoiding some, some sort of pain. It always, always, always is that. Now you say, well, I don't have any pain in my life. It could simply be a matter of something really small and really tiny that we're doing it for. And I think I put this next, maybe not. Nope, okay, I'll get to it. Um, imagine a weight loss pill that worked, the pain would still be there. So if uh, someone came out with a weight loss pill that said if you take this, you will lose one pound every single day until you get to completely ripped and chiseled so you could be on the cover of a magazine, that would be awesome and everybody would take it, but we would still have whatever pain caused us to possibly gain weight. And some people, there's different pain and there's different levels, but we would still have that pain. So. 95% of all people that ever came to me to personal train came to me because there was pain. And some people there was some significantly more pain. Very common for a woman to come to me and saying, said that my relationship with my husband is horrible. If I lose weight, he'll love me more. Very common, heard that all the time. And even in my little bit of knowledge way back then, I would say, it's not gonna work, it's not gonna work because we would see that all the time because the pain of the relationship was still there no matter what. It didn't have anything to do with fat or skinny. It had to do with something else that was going on. So the weight loss pill or the dieting or the eating to get to a certain level of where you think you wanna be, understand that the pain is still gonna be there. So eating isn't about, cannot be about avoiding pain. It needs to be about being healthy so that you can thrive and feel good and go on a vacation and climb a mountain if you want to or do whatever other things you want to do in life but that pain is separate from that the reason that we eat a lot of times and I think we all do is because we have pain pain being boredom man I'm bored I just don't have anything to do so we just go munch and it's a super quick thing there can be just a tiny little amount of pain that we have and that we'll eat which is often why yeah real common is so many people that I worked with. They would lose weight and put it back on. Lose weight, put it back on. Lose weight, put it back on. The reason is is because they would get down there, realize the pain wasn't there, and start eating again to mask that pain again. And they need to lose the pain to, uh, to get past that pain, but then eat again to mask that pain. So it was just this vicious cycle, and the eating and the weight fluctuations shouldn't have been a part of that. The pain should have been here, realizing I need to feel this pain, I need to get through this pain, because the other side is power. So separate those two things and understand when you have 
all of a sudden a craving, not because you haven't eaten nutrients, that's a different thing, that's a physical need that your body has. But instead of that, is there pain? Is there something? And as small as, I'm just bored. Okay, yeah, it's kind of, I'm, I'm bored, so a little bit, tiny bit of pain. What can I do instead of eat? Well, let me eat something, it's, eat something quality, and then what can I do to fill this time with something that's really quality and good? Food is only the middleman and it never works. And interesting. And we sedate with a lot of different things in our life. Food, alcohol, anger, work, sex, cocaine, talking on the phone. I mean, it can be everything and any, anything. We talked about that last, last week. That for me, sedation can be sitting in front of my computer at night just really doing nothing. That's just boredom sitting there finding something to do instead of anything else. So that's kind of one of my sedations. And exercise can certainly be that. All right. The question is, what if I just like the taste of food? So I eat a lot of food, I just like it. I just like food, I want, I want to eat all this food because it tastes awesome. So for me, it's like Cheetos, why do I eat it? I just like the taste of it, is that such a bad thing? Well, I mean, if, if, if the food is not allowing health, productivity, and longevity in your life, food is being used to flatten some sort of pain. So I go back to me, is that Cheetos, well, I honestly, honestly, I'm telling you, I don't eat that many of them. It's just like a handful of them once in a while. So I don't think that that's the case. I, I do now that I teach this stuff. Think about that. Is there some kind of pain? No, I just like it. But I'm not going to do too much because if I do do too much and they're after one or two handfuls, I really want more. But then I'll stop because then I realize that's not going to lead me to health and the exercise and the triathlons that I want to accomplish. So I'm not going to do that anymore. So then I will stop. So I think that that's true for the most part. All right. Job, to, job to satisfaction. So many people are in jobs that they just hate. And it's very common for people who are tired of their jobs, are stressed at their jobs, have anxiety at their jobs, don't want to get up because tomorrow morning, Monday morning, how many are sitting here going, oh my God, it's Monday again. This weekend was way too fast. And don't want to go to that. And so it's very common to mask that with overeating. Be careful with that. Again, it's pain. Look at your job dissatisfaction. And again, this book will help with a lot of things. And, and try to separate those two things. So very common. Um, in schools, you know, in a lot of jobs where there's just schools or an office environment where there's food all the time and it's so easy to overeat that. So, so, so easy. Isn't that right, Sandra? Yeah. It's your office, food everywhere in the kitchen? Yeah. yeah. How do they you guilt if you see them? You what? They you guilt. Oh, uh, yeah, they do. Well, you know, you know why? Miser oh, come on. You never eat anything. Yeah. Yeah. You're so skinny, that's ridiculous. What are you trying to do? Yeah. And let's see all that stuff. <laughs> All right. Here's four choices if you don't like your job is, and, and you overeat because of any kind of pain. Number one, you can keep eating to make that problem, uh, to make that problem go away, not the job. I was supposed to put away up there. So you can just keep eating and mask it and just keep doing what maybe you've done before or a lot of people do. Or you can move to another job. You're like, well, okay, first of all, I don't want to keep overeating and I'm not going to quit my job because it's a good paying job and it works. My family's, okay, so you got the job. Here's the third choice is demystify the current pain of the job. And that's where this book, this is part of your homework assignment. Demystify the current pain of the job and I'll teach you how to do that in a little bit. So is there really pain in the job? It, what is that? So let's talk a little bit deeper about that because that has a lot to do with overeating. Or love what is. Really three and four are the same and that is what this book is. And I'll get that. Okay, let's get to some more food stuff. Move away from the mindful eating. One thing that all eating plans have in common. One thing, if you look at every diet or eating plan that has ever been in the history of this world, is that they have vegetables in it. No diet has ever said, don't eat many vegetables. They're not good for you. <laughs> right? Now, the Atkins diet did say, don't eat too many carrots because it turns to sugar. Whatever. Right? But everybody says, eat vegetables. I mean, they will beat up meat or they will beat up fruit. They will beat up sugar, obviously. And all those different things. Vegetables is the one thing. So... I'm sorry, and I will tell you, I don't like vegetables. I just don't like vegetables. I'll eat them, I'll eat them. I'll make them and I'll eat them, but it's not something I want. A lot of people say I love vegetables and that's great, but I, I tend not to. So vegetables are the middle. Okay, this is what I have for lunch every single day or almost every single day. <laughs> Bianca, you will, Bianca, guarantee you will not like it. And if you eat it, post and tell, tell us what you think. Okay, so I take some of those power greens that I put in my smoothie. I just take a handful of that, put that in a bowl add olive oil and lemon juice, add sardines on top of there, and I cheat with a little bit of croutons, but that just makes it so much better. Sardines taste so much like salmon, and the omega-3s in there are significantly higher than salmon, and it's so easy because it's a can that you open up of sardines. So it's a really easy thing to do. Have you, who's, who's had sardines before, or recently? They're not bad, are they? They're not bad, but you don't see sardine salad in your restaurant, <laughs> No, you don't. You don't at all. But it's easy. 
Sardines. What tastes like salmon? I mean, yeah, I don't know. Smell. The H-E-B brand? Smell? Is that what it Oh, it smells horrible. No, somebody said smelt, I thought. Yeah, smelt. 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 Oh, smelt. smelt. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I think it's the same point of fish. I don't know. All right. All right. All right. If any of you guys want to. What? Is your dressing olive oil and lemon juice? Yeah, or olive oil and vinegar. Olive oil and lemon juice. That, that's. You can use tuna. You can use tuna. Tuna's fine. You can have salmon. You can have salmon, but then it's just more fixy. Yeah. Right? That's the only reason. So, sardines actually have more omega 3s than salmon. Or tuna? Than tuna, for sure. But all are good. I mean, if you feel like one one day or you don't ever want to do sardines, you want to do salmon, that's absolutely fine. So, I think this is. Any, any kind of. Mm -hmm. That's fine. That's great. Um, here's, here's some other options. Okay. Lettuce wraps with chicken tuna steak. So you can take uh, a chicken breast and cook up a bunch of chicken breasts or get one of those rotisserie chicken. Again, there's going to be hormones and antibiotics, but if you can get a chicken that's, that's better, bake, bake that ahead of time and then pull all the meat off and put them, just make lettuce wraps. Lots of romaine lettuce, very easy thing to do. Great, easy thing. And these are all portable things too. So romaine lettuce, I thought romaine lettuce didn't have that much nutrition. It doesn't as much, but they're big and they wrap well. Right, so add some of the other greens in there if you want to, but it's it's good for you. It's just not as good, but it, it's just a big leaf, so it wraps well. Okay. Um, leftovers from the night before, another lunch idea. And then if you're going to do carbs, so we've talked about this. Yes, the two the two best carbs are rice and potatoes. Sweet potatoes being the best of the potatoes. And by the way, we found out recently because w- what did we all what did all the trainers and nutritionists tell you was brown rice is better than white rice. Well, now they discovered that there is. I forget. There's something arsenic. arsenic in brown rice, oh my God. like a higher level that if you eat a lot of brown rice, it's probably not really good for you. you so you wild rice, you got to eat a lot. Of, you got to eat a lot of it. So here's the thing: is white rice is white rice is fine. Um, I have a, a rice cooker, which is like the awesome, most awesome thing because you just put like water and rice in there, set it, push the button, walk away, and then it's just done. It's so easy. So I'm all about as convenient as I can get. So. When you're eating lunch and you want to have rice and potatoes, sweet potatoes especially, are your best carbs. All right, here's some scenarios. If you are a person, you can put yourself in one of these categories. Is that if you love a good steak, you eat chicken as a healthy alternative, and no, I should eat more vegetables, but I don't function without my protein. If you're that kind of person, or if you are this person, I love carbs, but I try to eat more healthy alternatives like yogurt and cheese. I love a good egg and cheese bagel sandwich, which is awesome. And try to have at least some fresh fruits and vegetables every day. Or you are number three. I love a fruit smoothie with protein powder. I eat salad every day and I'm bored with the same old healthy options. I'm stuck in a rut and because of convenience, I eat the same foods as most people around me. The third person is going to be more the vegetarian type person. The second person is someone who really likes carbs and breads and things like that. The number one, or the first person is more the protein person. So here are solutions for someone who likes um, more of the meat type things. Now there's a lot of salads in there. You don't have to do all kinds of salads, but the sardine salad or any of those other options we talked about. Salad with veggies, chicken breast, salad with marinated grass-fed steak on there is a great thing too. So you can get lean cuts of meat or whatever type of, of beef that you want. Marinate that overnight. And by the way, in your last um, notes that I put up, that I sent out to you, the three recipes at the end those are recipes that I love. That salmon recipe is the best salmon recipe that you've ever had. You've got to try that salmon recipe. It was in the slides from last time. And then there was a recipe, or there was a marinade. It's called Moon's Marinade. There's a story behind that. My, that was my mom's, or the one that she used since we were little kids. And so when we would have big parties at the house or barbecues, she would get flank steak or skirt steak, flank steak, I think. Marinate that overnight. It is the best marinade, and then grill that. So if you want a marinade, try that marinade. It is so good. Um, and then the, the um, salmon on there is the best one. I forgot what else I put in there. So those are three of my recipes that I like. So if you're person number two who likes more of the starchy carbohydrates, this person's sweet tooth is generally a signal that the body needs more energy. Focus on some more grains to satisfy can be a reason. We talk, talk about grains. Um, if, but if you need that a small amount, <coughs> homemade soup and salad, Meat is optional if you want that in there. Soup and salad for a person like this will kind of curb those cravings. Second one is thick soup over rice or quinoa. It's a good thing to do. Curbs that so you have rice in there or quinoa so that carbohydrate it helps that. Healthy trail mixes snacks. Be careful what you get. And I don't have a, um, a recommendation to give you but I'll look one up for next time. I 
H-E-B has some really good organic trimmings. They do. They have a lot of different ones, don't they? Yeah, without all the M&M's and stuff. Because if yeah. you go to like Kroger's, they have M&M's. Which is, which is really good. Yeah, but. You know, I go to their bulk section, and I buy different things, and then I just make my own. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. It's just out of what H-E-B has. Yep. All right, let me get through this because we're running out of time. Um, this is person number three. You can have another smoothie if you want to. You can, you can always have more smoothies if you want to. Um, salad. Hummus with veggies. Consider that. That's a great snack, great easy snack that you can take with you. Um, salmon, tuna, or sardines are in a, as an alternative meat. I have sardines in there a lot. I like them. Sautéed spinach with garlic or olive oil. Forget about that. It's a great way to, to get your spinach in. All right. I think I'm going to save this part, the sugar stuff. Until next time, because we're running out of time. Um, I have two homework assignments for you guys. It's not that much. And I had mentioned grains in there. Grains can definitely be an anti or an inflammatory type food. Um, the gluten in there, there's now research that there's other things in there that are causing that we thought maybe gluten was, and this, but it doesn't matter. The point is, is that a lot of people do a lot better with bread. So I now can eat some bread. I'm fine with that. But back a year ago, when I was where I was, I cut bread for three, four months, and then I cut dairy for that period of time too. So if your homework cut one time out of the day, just one time, where you would normally have some dairy product or some bread, and, then, and cut that out and go without it and just see what it's like. That doesn't mean that you can never have bread again or dairy again. You can reintroduce it back into your life at a certain level, but then you start realizing, okay, I had a lot yesterday or today, and I feel like this, I have more mucus, I have more inflammation, my joints hurt. That's what I'll feel first thing as I get out of bed in the morning. It's like, ah, uh, that's not normal, that's food that caused that in me. So I know that when I start feeling that, all right, I'm gonna cut back for a little bit, get back into balance, because I know I'm starting to get back out of balance. Doesn't mean you can't have it, it just means if you're in a position where you have a lot of these things that you feel, cut it out for a little bit of time until it goes away, and then you can have little bits as you go, yep. There's, yeah, there definitely is. Yeah, there's definitely brains. The more whole grain, the more homemade. And if you can do homemade type thing that has more of the fiber and it's a slower digesting bread, it's going to be better. Absolutely. But why is vegetable oil so bad when vegetables are so good? It's the type of fat. Yeah. No, it, make, it, it, it makes sense. I've never been asked it that way before. Like, I never thought about that. Like, why is, is, is the oil so bad? All I know is that that type of oil, the polyunsaturated fat, has more of an inflammatory effect. That's why. Not in vegetables. Not in vegetables. Because you think of what it, what it takes, the amount of vegetables you'd have to eat to get that amount of oil. Right? Uh, uh, it really is. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Vegetables. You'd have to eat probably tables of, of the vegetables in order to get that much oil out of it. I don't know, maybe it'd just be a lot. And I think that's the answer for that. Yeah. So canola, peanut, what Canola's, canola's medium, I would still stay away from it. I will get a list of all the oils. I will get a list and I'll put up a list of all the oils because it's really interesting. Like the best to worst. Olive oil is going to be your best. Coconut oil, coconut oil we know is like the new king of oils. No, no. Um, no, you, you wouldn't. The, the interesting thing is the melting point of coconut oil is 84, 83 or 85 degrees. So in the summertime in your house, you'll open it and it'll be liquid. In the wintertime, it's always solid. And then if it's like 68 in your house or 65 or something, it'll be really solid. It's kind of interesting because it, right where we live is, is the melting point. Kind of interesting. Yeah, I've never understood about coconut oil because I thought like it's, beef fat, the reason it was bad is because it's solid. It Solid. Oil does the same thing. Yep. Yep. It's, it's a monounsaturated fat. It's so it's unsaturated. I mean, so the beef is saturated, yeah. monounsaturated. It just acts differently in your body. Okay. Yeah, that's why. Okay. So the homework assignment: the bread and the dairy. Try that once a day. And then I want everyone to get this book, whether you get the audio book or not. I'll put it in the notes. Um, Loving What Is by a lady named Byron Katie. And this book. Um, I think, I think everybody should read. I've read this, I'm on my third time reading it. I have the audio and I listen to it. I think I listened to it twice already. This lady teaches you how to take any thought in your head that agitates you, causes anxiety, stress, negativity, whatever. So a thought might be, I don't like that person because they're judging me. It teaches you how to say, uh, the, the, so the first question is, is, is that true? And you're like, yeah, it's true. 
And the second question is, is, can you absolutely know that's true positively without a doubt? And the answer to that is always no about any question when it's phrased that way, because you can't know. Is the sun going to come out tomorrow? Yes. Can you absolutely positively and we'll know? We, we can't know that, right? So, and then, then there's a whole way of turning it around, and what you realize is that, oh my gosh, I'm the one that's judging, and the reason I see them judging is because I'm judging them, and I, I, don't, I don't know that they're judging. I cannot know that they're judging me, absolutely positively, without a doubt, and the reason I don't like it is because I'm judging them. In fact, right now, I'm judging them by thinking this. And you go, whoa, it's me. So, job dissatisfaction, start taking everything with your job that you don't like, the person that you don't like, the person that's stuffing food at your, down your, your throat, and just start turning it around. Can we absolutely positively know that they, are, they look at me like I'm skinny and I'm wicked because I'm this and that or whatever, and they're shoving food? We can't know that. And then you start realizing, well, maybe it's me that has an insecure, wow, wow. So, this is what, this book has you do the turnaround and it's like will change your life and when you start thinking about things like that and it makes it so that your day is just calm all day long it's pretty cool so get this book or get the audio book it's on audio too i like to listen to a lot of the stuff so i can listen to it when i when i exercise but if you like to read you can read it too so there's homework yes so you talk about the meats and the earth being natural and all that what about vegetables and fruits because i know you say we should go organic yeah um I could put up a list of, yes, it's just because of the pesticides. There's some you don't need to, like an orange, because it's so thick, you don't need to. Bananas, you don't need to. But there's some that you should, like your lettuce. It's better to do that. Apples. Apples. Yes. Uh, peaches, for example, are very soft, and it absorbs it all in. But you can wash those and get some, but because the peaches can absorb it very well, it would be better to go organic with that. Apple, probably, but still, you could wash most of that off or a lot of that off. So. There's just different levels. If we could go all the way with that, then you can go all the way with that. So yeah, it is. Celery. Yeah. Get organic celery for sure. The celery, is one of them. I'll try to find a list of, of what vegetables you should and should. Why celery? It doesn't have a peel on it, that's why. Yeah, unless you wash it, yes. Okay. Perfect. All right, I'll find that and put that up. Yes. What about your, uh, the, tank, your tank on tuna? The, the amount of mercury that's in there is not enough, for the most part, to uh, negate the positive effects of what you get from it. So it was just a media thing overblown a lot. There is mercury in it, but it's not that much of a problem. Unless you're eating tuna up to, it was like five or six times a week. So if you're eating tuna every day, all, all the, a lot of it, or it's even more than that. Um, it's, it really isn't a problem. So it's not something throughout the years that I've worried about. When you look at the research, you have to get a lot of it in order to get that. So it was just kind of a media scare more than anything. So, any other questions? Then I'll let you go, and then I'll hit sugar pretty good next week. All right, you're welcome to go. You bet. Ah, yes, Mia. Mia wants to say something real quickly. Throwing money at you. <laughs> uh, Thursday, ninth, it's a nine week class, so it's uh, Thursday nights from five to nine, Saturday, Sunday, nine to five, and we yoga on that sort of five. I'm not sure why she's paying me what she's paying me. There you go. And that's for her and her daughter, daughter Mana. Okay. I, so, so I sent her an email and she said, well, I think this is the going rate and whatever, and I, I, didn't, I didn't argue too hard with it. Right. But anyway, Maddie Quick is her daughter. I have her little bag. Let's, 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 get, let's, me, let's get one. Let's, let's get one up front. In fact, ask Mia to, to take care of it for you before you leave. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, good work, Thanks. Real small stuff. Yeah. So I put the pot of greens in there, and in my mind, once I have all that, I think I got my vegetables. Uh, I kind of do too. Okay. Yeah, I kind of do too. And, and I will get that sardine salad, but and I'll do that, and then I'll do some broccoli. But I don't always do that. The what? Like to fill, like a filler at that point because the salad. Yeah. After that, yeah, kind of. I mean, I try to. The harder I'm training, the more I'll try to get more of that stuff, but. Because that's what motivates me to get, and that's the consumer, you do get better. Yeah, just, just, add, just add more fruit to it in the beginning, and then you can start cutting a little bit if you want to. But Mine was the liquid. It was, I wasn't putting enough. You can put as much liquid as you want to make it as, some people like it real thick and want to chew on it, but if but I'd rather have it li more liquidy and then just drink it. And I didn't put 
like the, I did half coconut oil. Uh, and then try, try raspberries sometime. I, didn't, I talked about blueberries, but raspberries make it taste really good. And it turns out like bright red, it's good. So.